Mr. Liang Enghua. Oh, Ms. Uh, Engineer Li Biwa. So the wrong arm. Thank you, uh, sir. I have uh, three supplementary questions. This morning, I received an email from a concerned mother who has a son in national service now. And she says that she understood from her son that the Tekan culture still exists in the national service. So I would like to ask Minister, is this Tekan culture allowed? And second, where is the channel for reporting such cases? And third, what would be the range of punishment for the officers involved? Thank you. Mr. Speaker, the member will know my answer. It will be the same answer. If any member of this House or any member of public can give me details that there has been abuse of power and that recruits have been unfairly treated, let me know. We will get, we will deal with it. We want our men to be, our soldiers to be well trained but it does not give an, any excuse to any commander to abuse his position, to abuse his authority, to do over and beyond what is necessary. If it's not safe for whatever reason, even well intentioned is wrong. That's the bottom line. No questions if you expose people to unsafe practices, go against training safety regulations, you're wrong from the outset. The excuses may mean very little because the TSRs are there to protect your men. And if you don't know how to protect the men, then I say you can't be a good commander. It's behavior pre prejudicial to good order and you don't deserve to be a commander and you'll be punished accordingly. Sir Chris D'Souza. Sir, it is extremely sad that we have deaths related to SCF training. My follow-up question is in relation to the unfortunate death of SCDF Corporal Koch at Tuas View Fire Station. Can the Minister for Home Affairs assure us that all steps are being taken to help ensure that such an unfortunate and unnecessary death does not happen again? I would like to um, remind members that uh, questions and queries should be confined to the statement made by the Minister for Defence. Um, I think we fully recognise that the need to, there's a need to fully discuss the unfortunate and tragic SEDF incident and members should file parliamentary questions and it should be added in this chamber. However, I'm prepared to permit this question if the Minister for Home Affairs wishes to respond. I will respond. There are, uh, Mr. Speaker, sir, there are three aspects um, to this tragic case. First, of course, is the family, uh, their grief, their loss at Corporal Cox passing, so, a young life which has been uh, prematurely cut short. So the family is at the front and center of our thoughts and uh, prayers. So as we talk about the other matters, I want to emphasize that. And tragic that this has happened. Uh, we must and we will do right by them and by the late Corporal Cox. I will now also uh, deal with the uh, two other points, the, uh, what happened in this case, and third, what we can do to try and make sure that this does not happen again. What happened, we have released the details that uh, we can at this stage. There is a fair bit of evidence as to what happened, both witnesses and objective evidence. But it's not appropriate for me to go 
into the details, the facts at this stage. There will be a board of inquiry. Majority of the members will be from outside the government. There will almost certainly also be criminal proceedings. Our AGC has told me that after the, reviewing the facts at this stage, uh, based on the facts that I have seen, I think so too. I'm usually very careful about saying these things, uh, but I think so too. There should be criminal charges. So the BOI will look into the facts. The facts will also come out in public uh, through court proceedings. Everything that is relevant will be out. So what I can say is that the conduct was unacceptable. It was a clear and serious violation of the rules. And there can be no excuse for the conduct. You know, people play games, they horse around, they make people like Corporal Cock do dangerous things, uh, even force them into dangerous situations. And people who do this don't think. Uh, they don't think how it can go wrong, and when it does go wrong, a life is lost, needlessly lost. So third, what are we going to do? I think it's imperative. We see what went wrong and uh, learn the lessons. What more can we do to stop this sort of behavior? I mean, we have clear rules. Commanders emphasize that to the officers. And all new enlistees are told about the rules. Punishments have been meted out. Detentions have been given when infractions have been found. But how do we make sure that there is zero tolerance? When people send their children to NS, they trust us, and we have to maintain their trust. So I have directed SCDF, as well as the other home team agencies, to relook at the rules, how they are enforced, focus on the enforcement, come up with a further set of measures by next week. Once they are finalized, I will announce them next week. Meanwhile, I've made it clear that hereafter, it will be a command responsibility to ensure that such conduct is not repeated. And hereafter, unit commanders will be held responsible for anything like this that happens, or any kind of uh, conduct that is in violation or in breach. So Commissioner Eric Yap has sent a letter in very clear terms on this yesterday to all officers. He has also personally spoken with the commanders uh, emphasizing that message and the same will be done with the other home team agencies. So there will be zero tolerance and we have to do, we will do our best uh, not to let this happen again. Thank you, sir. Mr. Pritam Singh. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have a few questions for the Minister of Defense pertaining to his earlier ministerial statement. Uh, my first question pertains to the COI uh, concerning that Sergeant Gavin Chan and the finding that his night vision device was not working. Uh, does the COI report indicate uh, whether the non-serviceability of the night vision device uh, could have been a critical factor in the incident, in that Third Sergeant Chan, had his device been working properly, uh, could have taken some uh, remedial action before the obstacle was, uh, was discovered uh, on, on the path where the, bionics, where the vehicle was moving. Uh, the second question is related to that, uh, whether in future MINDEF would consider making public uh, COI reports uh, as a form of closure for the public uh, with, of course, the relevant details redacted. Uh, it could be sensitivities on behalf of the family uh, and, and other operational reasons to, to redact certain information. Thank you. Speaker, I thank the member for his questions. 
the training safety regulations for armor training for at night require you to use night vision devices and exactly for the purpose when they are poor visibility you need to see where you're moving uh, you can move without night vision devices if you have as I said the hatch open and the lights on uh, it is the responsibility of the vehicle commander uh, to report if his night vision devices are not working and whereupon you stop the exercise for safety purposes Well, I've mentioned that we will now henceforth um, have decided that we want to give as much information as we can uh, and as uh, Mr. Pritam Singh says uh, apart from uh, sensitive issues or security reasons but by and large I think I will be, we should be prepared to give out as much information that's the reason why we have said that the external review panel will be a member of the COI. The COI will submit the full report to the external review panel for their questions, for their comments and views. And this external review panel for safety will write a report and that will be made public. Mr. Liang Ying Hua. Thank you, sir. <coughs> so Singaporeans who have served NS will not be unfamiliar with this word. King, you know, it, it, sometimes the, so the commanders will use uh, to, with a good intention to, to make the soldier work harder, to give the best, and also for the, for the, uh, you know, to, for the unit camaraderie. So they say, don't king or don't sky. But we do know that sometimes soldiers, uh, you know, do genuinely uh, are unwell and hence not able to perform up to mark. And it's not often that the commanders are able to to read this right or, or make the ju right judgment and sometimes not, not give the soldiers the benefit of doubt uh, and therefore take, take him off from the training. So I want to ask you know, the minister, how does the SDF strike the balance, you know, especially in our case where our NS men are, some are just, just fresh from school you know, and may not have the temperament and able to make the right decision to manage such situations. And also, how do we you know, use a more positive way to encourage our soldiers to give their best rather than a negative way of saying don't kick and therefore you know, that's how we should go about. Uh, should we look at how we can eradicate this, this, this form of practice uh, that we see in, in, you know, even in the good old days till today I believe this is still happening and how can we get that to use a more positive way to encourage soldiers to give their best. Mr. Speaker, sir, we should be governed by training safety regulations during training. And that's what they are there for. And the way our training safety regulations are written, they give the benefit of the doubt to the individual soldier. If he feels unwell, he can flag himself out. That's the starting point. Whether you think he's not completely truthful is besides the point. He has the prerogative to flag himself out. You can train him to do that same exercise later slowly graduated, but that's a command decision. But as these two examples show, that's not really the culture that pervades. Our young men who do NS are highly motivated. In the case of Kevin Chan, he wanted to complete the exercise for his unit. In the case of Dave Lee, he completed the eight kilometers fast march. So I sure that it's accurate to characterize this dilemma between pushing people because they are inherently uh, not as motivated. Our experience is that NS men are motivated and if they are not then it's up to your, it's your part of your skill sets to motivate him, to, to give him confidence to be able to complete the exercise. Mr. Vikram Singh. I'm mean, Mr. Vikram Nair. <laughs> My apologies. Um, Mr. Speaker, thank you. Um, I, I thank both ministers for their statements, and I think it just shows the seriousness of the matter that um, the ministers themselves take every death seriously. Um, and as a serviceman myself, I think tough trading is absolutely important. 
Now, one of the things that I think was a little bit troubling and which came out in social media as well, both in relation to Dave Lee as well as to Corporal Koch, was the allegation of uh, abuse, abuse of power. And I think both ministers are clear that this should not happen. Um, my suggestion would be that national servicemen be given an opportunity, perhaps a whistleblower's channel, uh, somewhere outside the respective units, perhaps directly to the ministry, in the event uh, there is such abuse or uh, fear of such abuse, especially if the fear is that the unit's culture encourages that, in which case they may be afraid of reporting within the unit. Uh, that's one suggestion. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, we have a safety hotline, 24-hour safety hotline that you can put, uh, that you can call and report it, and it will get attended to. Uh, when death occurs, emotions are riled up. You have many views, some substantiated, some unsubstantiated, which is why I've said that this House, our members here, also play a critical role in making sure that safety gets top priority. As we have shown in the case of Sergeant Gavin Chan, the CUI established fully the facts. And if there were people culpable, from as our previous CUIs show, they were held responsible. So in any case, in any death, where people are culpable or negligent, they will be dealt with according to criminal law or in our military courts. So I think we have enough cases to show that all of us want to have a zero fatality system. We are working towards that. If members have any other suggestions, I'm happy to hear them and see whether we can incorporate them. But I want to assure you, this gets topmost priority, gets top attention at MINDEF and the SAF. Mr. Kokeng Lun. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, whenever you talk about tough training, one of the things that affected will be their mental state, the psychological state. Uh, I know in this COI will we be actually be looking at the uh, mental and the psychological state of the soldier at that moment and especially important because I think uh, in this kind of situation especially when there's tough training the psychology state will actually affect the physical performance. Uh, it can be uh, not just on an individual but affecting the entire section platoon. And then, you know, during the process, under this kind of a situation, a soldier may just push himself, you know, to that extreme. So uh, I hope that maybe uh, we can also look at, uh, in future, how do we actually have more uh, psychological support uh, in the army, in the training. Thank you. The COI's primary mission is to establish the facts that led to the incident that caused the death the contributory factors. I mean, that's quite clear, and I think we understand that. If the psychological preparation of soldiers was inadequate, it would be flagged out. And yes, we pay attention to uh, the psychology of men. It's part and parcel of our military training. Mr. Murali Pillay. Uh, Mr. Speaker, sir, may I ask the Honourable Ministers whether two deceased national servicemen uh, would be allowed to observe and participate in the COI or BOI proceedings given the specific nature of the incidents, one being a physical training incident, the other incident being an incident that should not happen in the first place. Um, I think I understand what the member wants, uh, but uh, we have to understand that the COI's job is to determine the facts and they will interview uh, and in the process, usually they interview many soldiers who give different accounts. Uh, first of all, it may be emotionally trying for the parents to sit there and to hear many accounts of the same thing happening again and again. And even as I recounted uh, Sergeant Chan's uh, events, it's very difficult. And that's why we ask them permission. Can we reproduce this coroner's report? And if they said no, then I would have to rely just to release to this family, to this house, our COI report. Because that report by Queensland's uh, procedures is only given to the parents. I think we want to assure the parents 
of any unfortunate NS men who has died, that fully all the facts will be established. No cover-up, full investigations, anyone held responsible that deserves punishment will get punished. Neither should we go on a witch hunt. If there are honest mistakes, because the commanders are someone else's son too, NS men. Most of our SAF commanders are NS men. To this culture that there might be abuse, and yes, I believe that some of it say they may go overboard, but by and large, our NS men, our NS commanders are decent young men who are doing their duty that we ask them to do to raise fighting units. We want to strike a balance. We want to make sure that we in this house send the appropriate signal. We in leadership send the appropriate signal. Safety first. Do your job. If you abuse your position, you will be punished. But if you do your job dutifully, all the facts will come out, and you need not fear, but continue to do your job. Dr. Lee Linio. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. May I ask the Minister whether there is a hydration protocol in place to prevent heat stroke before and during exercises for our soldiers? What is this protocol and is it sufficient to prevent heat stroke? Uh, I also want to ask whether the thermometer that Corporal Davely was using was in good order. Thank you. Well, as I said, these are the facts that the COI and the police must investigate. So any findings that I give, I will put the caveat that the internal investigations, the COI and police reports should be disregarded. This is what we found. Uh, he was found to have a normal temperature before uh, the activity started. Whether the thermometer was working, I think we have to investigate that. I don't know. I presume it was because uh, it would be used for others as well. Uh, hydration protocols, yes, we do, and there are a certain volume that one has to take it. And uh, I think those with sons in the NS will recognize that it's done the rigor. Everybody stands up with a water bottle, and it takes the requisite volume, and you have to prove that you know, you've drunk it. Because someone, some worries that you know, some people may feel that there are enough water and they pour it on the ground. So, you know, all these measures, and I think for good units, they recognise that you know it's done uh, strictly followed because it's meant to protect the soldiers. Mr. Ganesh, Roger. Um, firstly, Minister, thank you for the comprehensive statement. I think I share your sentiment and I feel for the families for their loss. Um, having said that. Um, you've answered most of my questions. I just want to elaborate on one point about empathy and maturity of commanders. Um, I've got a son who's entering national service next year. And when I look at myself compared to him, when I did my national service, I'd like to think I was a lot more mature than him going in. And particularly that's because we have a very, uh, as society matures, kids are taken a lot better care of and they're more pampered at home. And we've got kids who are going into NS who are not the same ilk of before and I'd like to think that they're not as hardy Having said that, in terms of commanders, whether they are section commanders or uh, officers or other rank, um, will the, does the army focus on qualities like empathy as well as um, being able to assess um, how a kid is doing vis-a-vis -vis performance? Because I think, to be fair, I don't think it's intentional. I think all commanders and all NS men want to perform at the best of their ability, but sometimes it's difficult to tell and maybe they would need a lot more training in this area. So if the minister could share if there is such training and if it is going to be enhanced given that we are getting generations coming in that may be a little less hardy than what we were growing up. Thank you. I can summarize the members' question. How do we select commanders that have the necessary maturity and uh, wherewithal to make good judgments. It probably applies to all jobs. But in this debate on the President's address, think of what Singapore is doing with national service. Very few countries have been able to maintain national service. We are taking every 18-year-old, 19-year-old for two years, put them together and say as part of nation building, as part of building up a defense force, all a good home team, mix together, lead one another, train, work together, fight together. Do that in any society. 
you get the full plethora of the frailties of human nature. Malaysia started their NS, which included women. And even for that kind of activity, there were reported deaths for a variety of reasons. So we have to make sure that our NS men, the commanders, are well chosen. We have psychological tests. To the extent possible, they weed out those who have maladjusted attributes that are not fit to lead. In addition, peer appraisal plays a very important role. You are, a peer, you are appraised 360. And if your peers think that you're not fit to lead, that you don't have enough empathy or that you don't listen or that you don't have enough command presence or command ability, then we don't choose you. Can we step up the activity so that they can make good judgment, judgments? You know that at OCS we have a situational tests. We put people together, give them situations and assess how they respond. So yes, that's incorporated in trying to figure out the psychological elements that make a good leader and, see, and to see whether this chap has it or not. We have succeeded in our national service. And this is why it is so important that we give it the topmost priority when it comes to safety. We know that sons are precious. You give them to us, to the police, to SCDF for two years. We want to train them, we want to return them to you well-trained and safe. Mr. Dennis Tan. Question um, regarding uh, Third Sergeant Kevin. Um, I have two supplementary questions, but relate, not relating to Third Sergeant Kevin. Um, one, I think in respect of the answer that you have just given to a previous question, uh, Minister mentioned about uh, empathy training, uh, possibly during command school OCS or CISPAC. Um, may I also ask the minister whether he would consider uh, having further post-commission um, training, meaning for junior commanders um, after they have received their command rank. And the reason, the basis for my question is that I think those of us who have done national service before also realize that for some commanders, uh, you may not see this in OCS or in CISPAC, but after they have gotten the rank, uh, somehow the rank got to them, and that's where the abuse of power, the tendency for abuse may happen, perhaps in very small numbers, but nonetheless it's something that perhaps uh, the minister may wish to consider uh, looking into. My second uh, question relates to the minister's uh, information just now, where you mentioned that the second external review panel uh, will be, uh, correct me if I heard you wrongly, be given uh, access to the co uh, COI reports. Um, would the Minister also consider that uh, on other training safety related reports, perhaps of a lesser uh, uh, importance, let's say a BOI, in, in, intra-SAF BOI report uh, relating to some accidents or incidents which may not even involve uh, an actual casualty, but nonetheless relating to safety, training safety, uh, would this panel be given access to this, such reports so that they have a good uh, overview of the kind of incidents that may happen in SAF and to be able to provide suggestions for improvement? Thank you. Speaker, on the member's first question in terms of post-commission training for those who might be susceptible to uh, uh, abuse their position of authority, as I said, if you are in that position, uh, safety counts first. And we have the TSRs there so that regardless of your empathy level or your uh, authoritativeness, that you follow them. That's not negotiable. We can consider training them, but remember that these sons are given us for two years to the extent possible, all of them, sorry, all of them are given safety training while they are in specialist cadet school or OCS. So that's a mandatory module. For the external review panel, yes, the full CI will be given to them uh, so that they can uh, assess the information and ask more questions and from that write the report. My own position is that uh, there will be certain security elements, but by and large for many instances, 
the security elements can be maintained. And I would give as much information to this House, to uh, the external review panel that you want, so that they can too can come to an independent conclusion. Now, whether we want to include them to assess uh, serious injuries, uh, I think the members point not deaths, but not COIs or BOIs. I think uh, certainly if the, the ERP feels that they can do more work, I would be happy to ask them if they could also be included in that. Associate Professor Randolph Tan. Sir, sure. the question I had was uh, quite similar to what uh, Mr. Dennis Tan asked. I think the Minister will agree that uh, the thicker you make this, the, the TSRs, the more difficult it could actually be for the commanders in the field. So I think the uh, Minister referred earlier to uh, the mm -hmm. fact that uh, commanders actually need certain skills. Is there an ongoing system to assess whether there are deficits in the attitudes as well as the skills of commanders mm -hmm. in the field? Is there an ongoing system to ensure that if such deficits are actually discovered, that they can be remedied? Thank you. We receive for two years the entire spectrum of abilities from society for males. All of them come to us. And you have to run a system. Some, we have fairly rigorous selection criteria for commanders, OCS, Specialist cadet. Can you get it right each time? For the majority, yes. Are there some that you chose as commanders that are not fit to be? If there are attributes which show up and they do something wrong, they will be caught out. Because safety is not negotiable, as we tell them. So it's a difficult question that you ask. Uh, do we constantly second-guess and check on them. In honesty, it's difficult, but remember that in a military, uh, if the, it's a hierarchical situation so that uh, I think the commanders above them would spot it. So there are, there are these annual reviews, and, uh, but let me try to simplify this. We take it that commanders have various skill sets, various empathy levels. But let this message be very clear. When it comes to safety, it gets topmost priority. When it comes to the welfare of your men, that's your topmost priority. Whatever your skill sets, whatever your empathy level, you protect the well-being of your men first. Mr. Ang Hinkie. Mr. Let me first declare my interest. I have a family member who is serving the same platoon as uh, Corporal Dave Lee. And following the incident, there were many parents who were sharing concerns and worries, and as well as the NS men who is in the same platoon. So I'd like to ask the Minister if the Ministry is familiar with the state of affairs of the motivation and the level of our NS men in the same platoon, being in so close contact with the disease, as well as whether has conversation been taking place with the family members to assure them that the safety protocol are in place and their sons can continue to be in the exercise and the various um, operation readiness that they are being put through in the camp? When this incident occurred, uh, the army was mobilized very quickly. The top leadership levels, we stopped safety timeout for all activities, pause it, everybody stop. Safety first, check all processes, not even if it's not related to heat injuries. Then specifically for heat injuries, make sure that the protocols are in place and then we restart the training. For that individual unit, army commanders went down, engaged the men, engaged the family members of the deceased, Corporal Dave Lee, as well as, as you rightly pointed out, how it would affect his platoon mates. So, when there was social media, a social media furore over this, I was watching, will this divide, as you rightly alluded to, the men and their commanders? Will they gel together after this? 
And we have to learn from these lessons that when something wrong happens, does it divide or does it unite? Because no one can guarantee you that no such incident will occur in another period, in another time, in another unit. We will do our level best to get a zero fatality system. And it doesn't only apply to the SAF, it applies to other problems of society. And I think in this quiet chamber, where we have the equanimity to examine all the facts, to ask why are our men doing this, what is this purpose, what is, how do we run a system, is this a bad system, is it a good system, is there abuse that's rampant, or are men, are there a majority who are just trying their duty? We then come to very decisions that we need to do to strengthen the system but never degrade it, never reduce the trust, but build up this cachet. And each year that we can do this, the SAF will get stronger, the SAF will get safer to protect us. I'll take one more question. Mr. Yi Chia Singh. Uh, thank, thank you, Speaker. Uh, Minister, the memories are short. Human memories are short. So after every incident that happened, the danger is that when this current batch of servicemen graduate or they move on or they retire, the new batch of servicemen, all they have is the new TSRs that, they, that are modified or added, but is in a vacuum without context. So may I, I'm not sure whether we can change our safety training that the TSRs they, when we do the training, also to put context to it, to say, you know, we put in this TSR because that incident happened and we lost a serviceman uh, be, be, be because of that incident, so that people realize the importance of the TSRs for subsequent batches of servicemen. Thank you. Speaker, the member has made a very essential point for safety management systems. I used to be Minister of Manpower, and he's absolutely right. We went to countries that have very good safety systems, the Scandinavian countries, have excellent safety systems, uh, because that's a culture. So we have to build a culture so that even when commanders change, even when NS men change, you retain it. So some of you may have worked in ExxonMobil, where before every meeting they give you a safety briefing. Even if it's a 15-minute organizer, they'll give you a briefing to tell you where the exits are, to tell you what happens. It's de rigueur. We have to do that. We have to do that so that the systems, safety systems are maintained, and that's why we have unit, unit safety officers that build up this culture. It will take time, but we have gotten it. As I said, on average, we have one death a year. I believe if all of us give attention, as we did in 2012 to 2016, no fatalities. Let's give this our best attention. Let's go that extra mile and make sure that our sons remain safe.